The Jameson Satellite by Neil R. Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Horowitz. The Jameson Satellite by Neil R. Jones. The mammoths of the ancient world have been wonderfully preserved in the ice of Siberia. The cold, only a few miles out in space, will be far more intense than in the polar regions, and its power of preserving the dead body would most probably be correspondingly increased. When the hero scientist of this story knew he must die, he conceived a brilliant idea for the preservation of his body, the result of which even exceeded his expectations. What, how, and why are cleverly told here. Prologue The Rocket Satellite In the depths of space some twenty thousand miles from the Earth, the body of Professor Jameson, within its rocket container, cruised upon an endless journey, circling the gigantic sphere. The rocket was a satellite of the huge revolving world around which it held to its orbit. In the year 1958, Professor Jameson had sought for a plan whereby he might preserve his body indefinitely after his death. He had worked long and hard upon the subject. Since the time of the pharaohs, the human race had looked for a means by which the dead might be preserved against the ravages of time. Great had been the art of the Egyptians in the embalming of their deceased, a practice which was later lost to humanity of the ensuing mechanical age, never to be rediscovered. But even the embalming of the Egyptians, so Professor Jameson had argued, would be futile in the face of millions of years, the dissolution of the corpses being just as eventual as immediate cremation following death. The professor had looked for a means by which the body could be preserved perfectly forever, but eventually he had come to the conclusion that nothing on earth is unchangeable beyond a certain limit of time. Just as long as he sought an earthly means of preservation, he was doomed to disappointment. All earthly elements are composed of atoms, which are forever breaking down and building up, but never destroying themselves. A match may be burned, but the atoms are still unchanged, having resolved themselves into smoke, carbon dioxide, ashes, and certain basic elements. It was clear to the professor that he could never accomplish his purpose if he were to employ one system of atomic structure, such as embalming fluid or other concoction, to preserve another system of atomic structure, such as the human body, when all atomic structure is subject to universal change, no matter how slow. He had then soliloquized upon the possibility of preserving the human body in its state of death until the end of all earthly time to that day when the earth would return to the sun from which it had sprung. Quite suddenly one day he had conceived the answer to the puzzling problem which obsessed his mind, leaving him awed with its wild, uncanny potentialities. He would have his body shot into space, enclosed in a rocket to become a satellite of the earth as long as the earth continued to exist. He reasoned logically. Any material substance, whether of organic or inorganic origin, cast into the depths of space, would exist indefinitely. He had visualized his dead body enclosed in a rocket, flying off into the illimitable maw of space. He would remain in perfect preservation, while on earth millions of generations of mankind would live and die, their bodies to molder into the dust of the forgotten past. He would exist in this unchanged manner until the day when mankind, beneath a cooling sun, should fade out forever in the chill, thin atmosphere of a dying world. And still his body would remain intact, and as perfect in its rocket container as on that day of the far-gone past when it had left the earth to be hurled out on its career. What a magnificent idea! At first he had been assailed with doubts. Suppose his funeral rocket landed upon some other planet, or, drawn by the pull of the great sun, were thrown into the flaming folds of the incandescent sphere. Then the rocket might continue on out of the solar system, plunging through the endless seas of space for millions of years, to finally enter the solar system of some far-off star, as meteors often enter ours. Suppose his rocket crashed upon a planet, or the star itself, or became a captive satellite of some celestial body. 
it had been at this juncture that the idea of his rocket becoming the satellite of the earth had presented itself and he had immediately incorporated it into his scheme the professor had figured out the amount of radium necessary to carry the rocket far enough away from the earth so that it would not turn around and crash and still not be so far away but what the earth's gravitational attraction would keep it from leaving the vicinity of the earth in the solar system like the moon it would forever revolve around the earth he had chosen an orbit sixty-five thousand miles from the earth for his rocket to follow the only fears he had entertained concerned the huge meteors which careened through space at tremendous rates of speed he had overcome this obstacle however and had eliminated the possibilities of a collision with these stellar juggernauts in the rocket were installed radium repulsion rays which swerved all approaching meteors from the path of the rocket as they entered the vicinity of the space wanderer the aged professor had prepared for every contingency and had set down to rest from his labors reveling in the stupendous unparalleled results he would obtain never would his body undergo decay and never would his bones bleach to return to the dust of the earth from which all men originally came and to which they must return his body would remain millions of years in a perfectly preserved state untouched by the hoary palm of such time as only geologists and astronomers can conceive his efforts would surpass even the wildest dreams of h rider haggard who depicted the wondrous embalming practices of the ancient nation of kor in his immortal novel she wherein holly under the escort of the incomparable aisha looked upon the magnificent life-like masterpieces of embalming by the long-gone peoples of kor with the able assistance of a nephew who carried out his instructions and wishes following his death professor jameson was sent upon his pilgrimage into space within the rocket he himself had built the nephew and heir kept the secret forever locked in his heart generation after generation had passed upon its way gradually humanity had come to die out finally disappearing from the earth altogether mankind was later replaced by various other forms of life which dominated the globe for their allotted spaces of time before they too became extinct the years piled up on one another running into millions and still the jameson satellite kept its lonely vigil around the earth gradually closing the distance between satellite and planet yielding reluctantly to the latter's powerful attraction forty million years later its orbit ranged some twenty thousand miles from the earth while the dead world edged ever nearer the cooling sun whose dull red ball covered a large expanse of the sky surrounding the flaming sphere many of the stars could be perceived through the earth's thin rarefied atmosphere as the earth cut in slowly and gradually toward the solar luminary so was the moon revolving ever nearer the earth appearing like a great gem glowing in the twilight sky the rocket containing the remains of professor jameson continued its endless travel around the great ball of the earth whose rotation had now ceased entirely one side forever facing the dying sun there it pursued its lonely way a cosmic coffin accompanied by its funeral cortege of scintillating stars amid the deep silence of the eternal space which enshrouded it solitary it remained except for the occasional passing of a meteor flitting by at remarkable speed on its aimless journey through the vacuum between the far-flung worlds. Would the satellite follow its orbit to the world's end, or would its supply of radium soon exhaust itself after so many eons of time, converting the rocket into the prey of the first large meteor which chanced that way? Would it some day return to the Earth as its nearer approach portended, and increase its acceleration in a long arc to crash upon the surface of the dead planet? and when the rocket terminated its career would the body of professor jameson be found perfectly preserved or merely a crumbled mound of dust chapter one forty million years after entering within the boundaries of the solar system a long dark pointed craft sped across the realms of space toward the tiny point of light which marked the dull red ball of the dying sun which would some day lie cold and dark forever like a huge meteor it flashed into the solar system from another chain of planets far out in the illimitable universe of stars and worlds heading toward the great red sun at an inconceivable speed within the interior of the space traveller queer creatures of metal laboured at the controls of the space flyer which juggernauted on its way toward the far-off solar luminary rapidly it crossed the orbits of neptune and uranus and headed sunward 
The bodies of these queer creatures were square blocks of a metal closely resembling steel, while for appendages the metal cube was upheld by four jointed legs capable of movement. A set of six tentacles, all metal, like the rest of the body, curved outward from the upper half of the cubic body. Surmounting it was a queer-shaped head rising to a peak in the center and equipped with a circle of eyes all the way around the head. The creatures, with their mechanical eyes equipped with metal shutters, could see in all directions. A single eye pointed directly upward, being situated in the space of the peaked head, resting in a slight depression of the cranium. These were the Zoroms of the planet Zor, which rotated on its way around a star millions of light-years distant from our solar system. The Zoroms, several hundred thousand years before, had reached a stage in science where they searched for immortality and eternal relief from bodily ills and various deficiencies of flesh and blood anatomy. They had sought freedom from death and had found it, but at the same time they had destroyed the propensities for birth. And for several hundred thousand years there had been no births and few deaths in the history of the Zoroms. This strange race of people had built their own mechanical bodies and by operation upon one another had removed their brains to the metal heads from which they directed the functions and movements of their inorganic anatomies. There had been no deaths due to worn-out bodies. When one part of the mechanical men wore out, it was replaced by a new part, and so the Zoroms continued living their immortal lives, which saw few casualties. It was true that since the innovation of the machines, there had been a few accidents which had seen the destruction of the metal heads with their brains. These were irreparable. Such cases had been few, however, and the population of Zor had decreased but little. The machine men of Zor had no use for atmosphere, and had it not been for the terrible coldness of space, could have just as well existed in the ether void as upon some planet. Their metal bodies, especially their metal-encased brains, did require a certain amount of heat, even though they were able to exist comfortably in temperatures which would instantly have frozen to death a flesh-and-blood creature. The most popular pastime among the machine men of Zor was the exploration of the universe. This afforded them a never-ending source of interest in the discovery of the variegated inhabitants and conditions of the various planets on which they came to rest. Hundreds of spaceships were sent out in all directions, many of them being upon their expeditions for hundreds of years before they returned once more to the home planet of far-off Zor. This particular spacecraft of the Zoroms had entered the solar system whose planets were gradually circling in closer to the dull red ball of the declining sun. Several of the machine men of the spacecraft's crew, which numbered some fifty individuals, were examining the various planets of this particular planetary system carefully through telescopes possessing immense power. These machine men had no names and were indexed according to letters and numbers. They conversed by means of thought impulses and were neither capable of making a sound vocally, nor of hearing one uttered. "'Where shall we go?' queried one of the men at the controls, questioning another who stood by his side examining a chart on the wall. "'They all appear to be dead worlds, 4R3579,' replied the one addressed. "'But the second planet from the sun appears to have an atmosphere which might sustain a few living creatures, and the third planet may also prove interesting, for it has a satellite.' We shall examine the inner planets first of all, and explore the outer ones later if we decide it is worth the time. Too much trouble for nothing, ventured 9G721. This system of planets offers us little but what we have seen many times before in our travels. The sun is so cooled that it cannot sustain the more common life on its planets, the type of life form we usually find in our travels. We should have visited a planetary system with a brighter sun. You speak of common life remarked 25X987. What of the uncommon life? Have we not found life existent on cold dead planets with no sunlight and atmosphere at all? Yes, we have, admitted 9G721, but such occasions are exceedingly rare. The possibility exists, however, even in this case, reminded 4R3579. And what if we do spend a bit of unprofitable time in this one planetary system? Haven't we all an endless lifetime before us? Eternity is ours. We shall visit this second planet first of all, directed 25X987, who was in charge of this particular expedition of the Zoroms. And on the way there we shall cruise along near the third planet to see what we can of the surface. We may be able to tell whether or not it holds anything of interest to us. If it does, after visiting the second planet, we shall return to the third. 
the first world is not worth bothering with the spaceship from zor raced on in a direction which would take it several thousand miles above the earth and then on to the planet which we know as venus as the spaceship rapidly neared the earth it slackened its speed so that the zoromes might examine it closely with their glasses as the ship passed the third planet suddenly one of the machine men ran excitedly into the room where 25X987 stood watching the topography of the world beneath him. "'We have found something!' he exclaimed. "'What?' "'Another spaceship!' "'Where?' "'But a short distance ahead of us on our course. Come into the forepart of the ship, and you can pick it up with the glass.' "'Which way is it going?' asked 25X987. "'It is behaving queerly,' replied the machine man of Zor. It appears to be in the act of circling the planet. Do you suppose that there really is life on that dead world? Intelligent beings like ourselves, and that this is one of their spacecraft? Perhaps it is another exploration craft like our own from some other world, was a suggestion. But not of ours, said 25X987. The two Zoroms now hastened into the observation room of the spaceship, where more of the machine men were excitedly examining the mysterious spacecraft, their thought impulses flying thick and fast like bodiless bullets. It is very small. Its speed is slow. The craft can hold but few men, observed one. We do not yet know of what size the creatures are, reminded another. Perhaps there are thousands of them in that spacecraft out there. They may be of such a small size that it will be necessary to look twice before finding one of them. Such beings are not unknown. We shall soon overtake it and see. I wonder if they have seen us. Where do you suppose it came from? From the world beneath us, was a suggestion. Perhaps. Chapter 2 The Mysterious Spacecraft The machine men made way for their leader, 25X987, who regarded the spacecraft ahead of them critically. "'Have you tried communicating with it yet?' he asked. "'There is no reply to any of our signals,' came the answer. "'Come alongside of it, then,' ordered their commander. "'It is small enough to be brought inside our carrying compartment, "'and we can see with our penetration rays just what manner of creature it holds. "'They are intelligent, that is certain, for their spaceship does imply as much.' The space flyer of the Zorum slowed up as it approached the mysterious wanderer of the cosmic void which hovered in the vicinity of the dying world. "'What a queer shape it has,' remarked 25X987. "'It is even smaller than I had previously calculated.' A rare occurrence had taken place among the machine men of Zor. They were overcome by a great curiosity which they could not allow to remain unsatiated. Accustomed as they were to witnessing strange sights and still stranger creatures, meeting up with weird adventures in various corners of the universe, they had now become hardened to the usual run of experiences which they were in the habit of encountering. It took a great deal to arouse their unperturbed attitudes. Something new, however, about this queer spacecraft had gripped their imaginations, and perhaps a subconscious influence asserted to their minds that here they have come across an adventure radically unusual." "'Come alongside it,' repeated 25X987 to the operator as he returned to the control room and gazed through the side of the spaceship in the direction of the smaller cosmic wanderer. "'I'm trying to,' replied the machine man, "'but it seems to jump away a bit every time I get within a certain distance of it. Our ship seems to jump backward a bit, too.' "'Are they trying to elude us?' "'I don't know. They should pick up more speed if that is their object.' Perhaps they are now progressing at their maximum speed and cannot increase their acceleration any more. Look, exclaimed the operator, did you just see that? The thing has jumped away from us again. Our ship moved also, said 25X987. I saw a flash of light shoot from the side of the other craft as it jumped. Another machine man now entered and spoke to the commander of the Zorum expedition. They are using radium repellent rays to keep us from approaching, he informed. Counteract it, instructed 25X987. The man left, and now the machine man at the controls of the craft tried again to close with the mysterious wanderer of the space between planets. The effort was successful, and this time there was no glow of repulsion rays from the side of the long metal cylinder. 
They now entered the compartment where various objects were transferred from out the depths of space to the interplanetary craft. Then patiently they waited for the rest of the machine men to open the side of their spaceship and bring in the queer elongated cylinder. Put it under the penetration ray, ordered 25X987. Then we shall see what it contains. The entire group of Zoroms were assembled about the long cylinder, whose low nickel-plated sides shone brilliantly. With interest, they regarded the fifteen-foot object which tapered a bit toward its base. The nose was pointed like a bullet. Eight cylindrical protuberances were affixed to the base, while the four sides were equipped with fins such as are seen on aerial bombs to guide them in a direct, unswerving line through the atmosphere. At the base of the strange craft there projected a lever, while in one side was a door which, apparently, opened outward. One of the machine men reached forward to open it, but was halted by the admonition of the commander. "'Do not open it up yet,' he warned. "'We are not aware of what it contains.' Guided by the hand of one of the machine men, a series of lights shone down upon the cylinder. It became enveloped in a haze of light which rendered the metal sides of the mysterious spacecraft dim and indistinct, while the interior of the cylinder was as clearly revealed as if there had been no covering. The machine men, expecting to see at least several, perhaps many, strange creatures moving about within the metal cylinder, stared aghast at the sight they beheld. There was but one creature, and he was lying perfectly still, either in a state of suspended animation or else of death. He was about twice the height of the mechanical men of Zor. For a long time they gazed at him in a silence of thought, and then their leader instructed them, "'Take him out of the container!' The penetration rays were turned off, and two of the machine men stepped eagerly forward and opened the door. One of them peered within at the recumbent body of the weird-looking individual with the four appendages. The creature lay up against a luxuriously upholstered interior, a strap affixed to his chin, while four more straps held both the upper and lower appendages securely to the insides of the cylinder. The machine man released these, and with the help of his comrade, removed the body of the creature from the cosmic coffin in which they had found it. "'He is dead,' pronounced one of the machine men after a long and careful examination of the corpse. "'He has been like this for a long time.' "'There are strange thought impressions left upon his mind,' remarked another. One of the machine men, whose metal body was of a different shade than that of his companions, stepped forward, his cubic body bent over that of the strange, cold creature who was garbed in fantastic accoutrements. He examined the dead organism a moment, and then he turned to his companions. "'Would you like to hear his story?' he asked. "'Yes,' came the concerted reply. "'You shall, then,' was the ultimatum. "'Bring him into my laboratory. I shall remove his brain and stimulate the cells into activity once more.' We shall give him life again, transplanting his brain into the head of one of our machines. With these words, he directed two of the Zoroms to carry the corpse into the laboratory. As the spaceship cruised about in the vicinity of this third planet, which 25X987 had decided to visit on finding the metal cylinder with its queer inhabitant, 8B52, the experimenter, worked unceasingly in his laboratory to revive the long-dead brain cells to action once more. Finally, after consummating his desires and having his efforts crowned with success, he placed the brain within the head of a machine. The brain was brought to consciousness. The creature's body was discarded after the all-important brain had been removed. Chapter 3. Recalled to Life As Professor Jameson came to, he became aware of a strange feeling. He was sick. The doctors had not expected him to live. They had frankly told him so but he had cared little in view of the long, happy years stretched out behind him. Perhaps he was not to die yet. He wondered how long he had slept, how strange he felt, as if he had no body. Why couldn't he open his eyes? He tried very hard. A mist swam before him. His eyes had been open all the time, but he had not seen before. That was queer, he ruminated. All was silent about his bedside. Had all the doctors and nurses left him to sleep or to die? Devil take that mist which now swam before him, obscuring everything in line of vision. He would call his nephew. Vainly he attempted to shout the word, Douglas! But to no avail. Where was his mouth? It seemed as if he had none. Was it all delirium? The strange silence. Perhaps he had lost his sense of hearing along with his ability to speak. And he could see nothing distinctly. 
the mist had transferred itself into a confused jumble of indistinct objects, some of which moved about before him. He was now conscious of some impulse in his mind which kept questioning him as to how he felt. He was conscious of other strange ideas which seemed to be impressed upon his brain, but this one thought concerning his indisposition clamored insistently over the lesser ideas. It even seemed just as if someone was addressing him, and impulsively he attempted to utter a sound and tell them how queer he felt. It seemed as if speech had been taken from him. He could not talk, no matter how hard he tried. It was no use. Strange to say, however, the impulse within his mind appeared to be satisfied with the effort, and it now put another question to him. Where was he from? What a strange question, when he was at home. He told them as much. Had he always lived there? Why, yes, of course. The aged professor was now becoming more astute as to his condition. At first, it was only a mild passive wonderment at his helplessness and the strange thoughts which raced through his mind. Now he attempted to arouse himself from the lethargy. Quite suddenly his sight cleared, and what a surprise! He could see all the way around him without moving his head, and he could look at the ceiling of his room. His room? Was it his room? No, it just couldn't be. Where was he? What were those queer machines before him? They moved on four legs. Six tentacles curled outward from their cubical bodies. One of the machines stood close before him. A tentacle shot out from the object and rubbed his head. How strange it felt upon his brow. Instinctively, he obeyed the impulse to shove the contraption of metal from him with his hands. His arms did not rise. Instead, six tentacles projected upward to force back the machine. Professor Jameson gasped mentally in surprise as he gazed at the result of his urge to push the strange, unearthly-looking machine caricature from him. With trepidation, he looked down at his own body to see where the tentacles had come from, and his surprise turned to sheer fright and amazement. His body was like the moving machine which stood before him. Where was he? What ever had happened to him so suddenly? Only a few moments ago he had been in his bed, with the doctors and his nephew bending over him, expecting him to die. The last words he had remembered hearing was the cryptic announcement of one of the doctors. He is going now. But he hadn't died after all, apparently. A horrible thought struck him. Was this the life after death? Or was it an illusion of the mind? He became aware that the machine in front of him was attempting to communicate something to him. How could it, thought the professor, when he had no mouth? The desire to communicate an idea to him became more insistent. The suggestion of the machine man's question was in his mind. Telepathy, thought he. The creature was asking about the place whence he had come. He didn't know. His mind was in such a turmoil of thoughts and conflicting ideas. He allowed himself to be led to a window, where the machine, with waving tentacle, pointed toward an object outside. It was a queer sensation to be walking on the four metal legs. He looked from the window, and he saw that which caused him to nearly drop over, so astounded was he. The professor found himself gazing out from the boundless depths of space, across the cosmic void to where a huge planet lay quiet. Now he was sure it was an illusion which made his mind and sight behave so queerly. He was troubled by a very strange dream. Carefully he examined the topography of the gigantic globe which rested off in the distance. At the same time, he could see back of him the concourse of mechanical creatures crowding up behind him, and he was aware of a telepathic conversation which was being carried on behind him, or just before him. Which was it now? Eyes extended all the way around his head, while there existed no difference on any of the four sides of his cubed body. His mechanical legs were capable of moving in any of the four given directions with perfect ease, he discovered. The planet was not the Earth, of that he was sure. None of the familiar continents lay before his eyes. And then he saw the great dull red ball of the dying sun. That was not the sun of his earth. It had been a great deal more brilliant. "'Did you come from that planet?' came the thought impulse from the mechanism by his side. "'No,' he returned. He then allowed the machine men, for he assumed that they were machine men, and he reasoned that somehow or other they had by some marvelous transformation made him over just as they were— to lead him through the craft of which he now took notice for the first time. It was an interplanetary flyer, or spaceship, he firmly believed. 
25X987 now took him to the compartment which they had removed him to from the strange container they had found wandering in the vicinity of the nearby world. There they showed him the long cylinder. "'It's my rocket satellite!' exclaimed Professor Jameson to himself, though in reality every one of the machine men received his thoughts plainly. "'What is it doing here?' "'We found your dead body within it,' answered 25X987. "'Your brain was removed to the machine after having been stimulated into activity once more. Your carcass was thrown away.' Professor Jameson just stood dumbfounded by the words of the machine men. "'So I did die,' exclaimed the professor, "'and my body was placed within the rocket to remain in everlasting preservation until the end of all earthly time. Success! I have attained unrivaled success!' He then turned to the machine man. "'How long have I been that way?' he asked excitedly. "'How should we know?' replied the Zorom. "'We picked up your rocket only a short time ago, which, according to your computation, would be less than a day. This is our first visit to your planetary system, and we chanced upon your rocket. So it is a satellite. We didn't watch it long enough to discover whether or not it was a satellite. At first we thought it to be another traveling spacecraft, but when it refused to answer our signals, we investigated. And so that was the earth at which I looked, mused the professor. No wonder I didn't recognize it. The topography has changed so much. How different the sun appears. It must have been over a million years ago when I died. Many millions, corrected 25X987. Suns of such size as this one do not cool in so short a time as you suggest. Professor Jameson, in spite of all his amazing computations before his death, was staggered by the reality. Who are you? he suddenly asked. We are the Zoromes from Zor, a planet of a sun far across the universe. 25X987 then went on to tell Professor Jameson something about how the Zoromes had attained their high stage of development and had instantly put a stop to all birth, evolution, and death of their people by becoming machine men. Chapter 4 The Dying World And now tell us of yourself, said 25X987, and about your world. Professor Jameson, noted in college as a lecturer of no mean ability and perfectly capable of relating intelligently to them the story of Earth's history, evolution, and march of events following the birth of civilization up until the time when he died, began his story. The mental speech hampered him for a time, but he soon became accustomed to it so as to use it easily, and he found it preferable to vocal speech after a while. The Zoromes listened interestedly to the long account until Professor Jameson had finished. "'My nephew,' concluded the professor, "'evidently obeyed my instructions and placed my body in the rocket I had built, shooting it out into space where I became the satellite of the Earth for these many millions of years.' "'Do you really want to know how long you were dead before we found you?' asked 25X987. "'It would be interesting to find out.' "'Yes, I should like very much to know,' replied the professor. "'Our greatest mathematician, 459C79, will tell it to you.' The mathematician stepped forward. Upon one side of his cube were many buttons arranged in long columns and squares. "'What is your unit of measuring?' he asked. "'A mile. "'How many times more is a mile than is the length of your rocket satellite?' "'My rocket is fifteen feet long. "'A mile is five thousand two hundred and eighty feet.' "'The mathematician depressed a few buttons. "'How far or how many miles from the sun was your planet at the time?' Ninety-three million miles,' was the reply." And your world satellite, which you call Moon from your planet, Earth? 240,000 miles. And your rocket? I figured it to go about 65,000 miles from the Earth. It was only 20,000 miles from the Earth when we picked it up, said the mathematician, depressing a few more buttons. The Moon and Sun are also much nearer your planet now. Professor Jameson gave way to a mental ejaculation of amazement. "'Do you know how long you have cruised around the planet in your own satellite?' said the mathematician. 
Since you began that journey, the planet which you call the Earth has revolved around the sun over forty million times. Forty million years, exclaimed Professor Jameson haltingly. Humanity must then have all perished from the Earth long ago. I'm the last man on Earth. It's a dead world now, interjected 25X987. Of course, elucidated the mathematician, those last few million years are much shorter than the ones in which you lived. The Earth's orbit is of less diameter, and its speed of revolution is greatly increased, due to its proximity to the cooling sun. I should say that your year was some four times as long as the time in which it now takes your old planet to circumnavigate the sun. How many days were there in your year? 365. The planet has now ceased rotating entirely. Seems queer that your rocket satellite should avoid the meteor so long, observed 459C79, the mathematician. Automatic radium repulsion rays, explained the professor. The very rays which kept us from approaching your rocket, stated 25X987, until we neutralized them. You died and were shot out into space long before any life occurred on Zor, soliloquized one of the machine men. Our people had not yet even been born when yours had probably disappeared entirely from the face of the earth. Hearken to 72N4783, said 25X987. He is our philosopher, and he just loves to dwell on the past lives of Zor when we were flesh and blood creatures, with the threat of death hanging always over our heads. At that time, like the life you knew, we were born, we lived, and died, all within a very short time, comparatively. Of course, time has come to mean nothing to us, especially when we were out in space, observed 72N4783. We never kept track of it on our expeditions, though back in Zor such accounts are accurately kept. By the way, do you know how long we stood here while you recounted to us the history of your planet? Our machine bodies never get tired, you know. Well, ruminated Professor Jameson, giving a generous allowance of time, I should say about a half a day, although it seems scarcely as long as that. We listened to you for four days replied 72N4783. Professor Jameson was really aghast. Really, I hadn't meant to be such a bore, he apologized. That is nothing, replied the other. Your story was interesting, and if it had been twice as long, it would not have mattered, nor would it have seemed any longer. Time is merely relative, and in space, actual time does not exist at all. Any more than your forty million years' cessation of life seemed more than a few moments to you. We saw that it was so when your first thought impressions reached us following your revival. Let us continue on to your planet Earth, then said 25X987. Perhaps we shall find more startling disclosures there. As the spaceship of the Zoroms approached the sphere from which Professor Jameson had been hurled in his rocket forty million years before, the professor was wondering how the earth would appear, and what radical changes he would find. Already he knew that the geographical conditions of the various continents were changed. He had seen as much from the spaceship. A short time later the earth was reached. The space travelers from Zor, as well as Professor Jameson, emerged from the cosmic flyer to walk upon the surface of the planet. The earth had ceased rotating, leaving one half its surface always toward the sun. This side of the earth was heated to a considerable degree, while its antipodes, turned always away from the solar luminary, was a cold, frigid, desolate waste. The space travelers from Zor did not dare to advance very far into either hemisphere, but landed on the narrow thousand-mile strip of territory separating the earth's frozen half from its sun-baked antipodes. As Professor Jameson emerged from the spaceship with 25X987, he stared in awe at the great transformation 400,000 centuries had wrought. The Earth's surface, its sky, and the sun were all so changed and unearthly appearing. Off to the east, the blood-red ball of the slowly cooling sun rested upon the horizon, lighting up the eternal day. The Earth's rotation had ceased entirely, and it hung motionless in the sky as it revolved around its solar parent, its orbit slowly but surely cutting in toward the great body of the sun. The two inner planets, Mercury and Venus, 
were now very close to the blood-red orb whose scintillating, dazzling brilliance had been lost in its cooling process. Soon, the two nearer planets would succumb to the great pull of the solar luminary and return to the flaming folds from which they had been hurled out as gaseous bodies in the dim, age-old past when their careers had just begun. The atmosphere was nearly gone, so rarefied had it become, and through it Professor Jameson could view with amazing clarity without discomfort to his eyes the bloated body of the dying sun. It appeared many times the size he had seen it at the time of his death, on account of its relative nearness. The earth had advanced a great deal closer to the great star around which it swung. The sky towards the west was pitch black except for the iridescent twinkle of the fiery stars which studded that section of the heavens. As he watched, a faint glow suffused the western sky, gradually growing brighter. The full moon majestically lifted itself above the horizon, casting its pale ethereal radiance upon the dying world beneath. It was increased to many times the size Professor Jameson had ever seen it during his natural lifetime. The earth's greater attraction was drawing upon the moon just as the sun was pulling the earth ever nearer itself. This cheerless landscape confronting the professor represented the state of existence to which the earth had come. It was a magnificent spread of loneliness, which bore no witness to the fact that it had seen the teeming of life in better ages long ago. The weird yet beautiful scene, spread in a melancholy panorama before his eyes, drove his thoughts into gloomy abstraction, with its dismal, depressing influence. Its funereal, oppressive aspect smote him suddenly with the chill of a terrible loneliness. 25X987 aroused Professor Jameson from his lethargic reverie. Let us walk around and see what we can find. I can understand how you feel in regard to the past. It is quite a shock, but it must happen to all worlds sooner or later, even to Zor. When that time comes, the Zoromes will find a new planet on which to live. If you travel with us, you will become accustomed to the sight of seeing dead lifeless worlds, as well as new and beautiful ones, pulsating with life and energy. Of course, this world being your own holds a peculiar sentimental value to you, but it is really one planet among billions. Professor Jameson was silent. "'I wonder whether or not there are any ruins here to be found?' queried 25X-987. "'I don't believe so,' replied the professor. "'I remember hearing an eminent scientist of my day state that, given fifty thousand years, every structure and other creation of man would be obliterated entirely from off the Earth's surface.' "'And he was right,' endorsed the machine man of Zor. "'Time is a great effacer.' For a long time the machine men wandered over the dreary surface of the earth, and then 25X-987 suggested a change of territory to explore. In the spaceship they moved around the earth to the other side, still keeping to the belt of the Shadowland, which completely encircled the globe like some gigantic ring. Where they now landed arose a series of cones with hollow peaks. Volcanoes! exclaimed the professor. Extinct ones! added the machine man. Leaving the spaceship, the fifty or more machine men, including also Professor Jameson, were soon exploring the curiously shaped peaks. The professor, in his wanderings, had strayed away from the rest, and now advanced into one of the cup-like depressions of the peak, out of sight of his companions, the Zoromes. Chapter 5 Eternity or Death he was well in the center of the cavity when the soft ground beneath him gave way suddenly and he catapulted below into the darkness. Through the Stygian gloom he fell in what seemed to be an endless drop. He finally crashed upon something hard. The thin crust of the volcano's mouth had broken through, precipitating him in the deep hollow interior. It must have been a long ways to fall, or so it had seemed. Why was he not knocked senseless or killed? Then he felt himself over with three tentacles. His metal legs were four broken, twisted masses of metal, while the lower half of his cubic body was jammed out of shape and split. He could not move, and half of his six tentacles were paralyzed. How would he ever get out of there, he wondered. The machine men of Zor might never find him. What would happen to him, then? He would remain in this deathless, monotonous state forever in the black hole of the volcano's interior, unable to move. What a horrible thought! 
He could not starve to death. Eating was unknown among the Zoroms, the machines requiring no food. He could not even commit suicide. The only way for him to die would be to smash the strong metal head, and in his present immovable condition this was impossible. It suddenly occurred to him to radiate thoughts for help. Would the Zoroms receive his messages? He wondered how far the telepathic messages would carry. He concentrated the powers of his mind upon the call for help, and repeatedly stated his position and plight. He then left his mind clear to receive the thought answers of the Zoroms. He received none. Again he tried. Still he received no welcoming answer. Professor Jameson became dejected. It was hopeless. The telepathic messages had not reached the machine men of Zor. They were too far away, just as one person may be out of earshot of another's voice. He was doomed to a terrible fate of existence. It were better that his rocket had never been found. He wished that the Zoroms had destroyed him instead of bringing him back to life, back to this. His thoughts were suddenly broken in upon. We're coming! Don't give up hope! If the professor's machine body had been equipped with a heart, it would have sung for joy at these welcome thought impressions. A short time later, there appeared in the ragged break of the volcano's mouth where he had fallen through the metal head of one of the machine men. "'We shall have you out of there soon,' he said. The professor never knew how they managed it, for he lost consciousness under some strange ray of light they projected down upon him in his prison. When he came to consciousness once more, it was to find himself inside the spaceship. "'If you had fallen and smashed your head, it would have been all over with you.' were the first thought impulses which greeted him. As it is, however, we can fix you up first rate. Why didn't you answer the first time I called to you? asked the professor. Didn't you hear me? We heard you, and we answered, but you didn't hear us. You see, your brain is different than ours, and though you can send thought waves as far as we can, you cannot receive them from such a great distance. I'm wrecked said the professor, gazing at his twisted limbs, paralyzed tentacles, and jammed body. "'We shall repair you,' came the reply. "'It is your good fortune that your head was not crushed.' "'What are you going to do with me?' queried the professor. "'Will you remove my brains to another machine?' "'No, it isn't necessary. We shall merely remove your head and place it upon another machine body.' The Zoroms immediately set to work upon the task and soon had Professor Jameson's metal head removed from the machine which he had wrecked in his fall down the crater. All during the painless operation, the professor kept up a series of thought exchanges and conversation with the Zoroms, and it seemed but a short time before his head surmounted a new machine and he was ready for further exploration. In the course of his operation, the spaceship had moved to a new position, and now as they emerged, 25X987 kept company with Professor Jameson. "'I must keep an eye on you.' he said. You will be getting into more trouble before you get accustomed to the metal bodies. But Professor Jameson was doing a great deal of thinking. Doubtlessly, these strange machine men who had picked up his rocket in the depths of space and had brought him back to life were expecting him to travel with them and become adopted into the ranks of the Zoroms. Did he want to go with them? He couldn't decide. He had forgotten that the machine men could read his innermost thoughts. You wish to remain here, alone, upon the earth? asked 25X987. "'It is your privilege if you really want it so.' "'I don't know,' replied Professor Jameson truthfully. He gazed at the dust around his feet. It had probably been the composition of men, and had changed from time to time into various other atomic structures, of other queer forms of life which had succeeded mankind. It was the law of the atom which never died, and now he had within his power perpetual existence— he could be immortal if he wished. It would be an immortality of never-ending adventures in the vast, endless universe among the galaxy of stars and planets. A great loneliness seized him. Would he be happy among these machine men of another far-off world, among these Zoroms? They were kindly and solicitous of his welfare. What better fate could he expect? Still, a longing for his own kind arose in him, the call of humanity. It was irresistible. What could he do? Was it not in vain? Humanity had long since disappeared from the earth, millions of years ago. He wondered what lay beyond the pales of death, the real death, 
where the body decomposed and wasted away to return to the dust of the earth and assume new atomic structures. He had begun to wonder whether or not he had been dead all these forty millions of years. Suppose he had been merely in a state of suspended animation. He had remembered a scientist of his day who had claimed that the body does not die at the point of official death. According to the claims of this man, the cells of the body did not die at the moment at which respiration, heartbeats, and the blood circulation ceased, but it existed in the semblance of life for several days afterward, especially in the cells of the bones, which died last of all. Perhaps when he had been sent out into space in his rocket right after his death, the action of the cosmic void was to halt his slow death of the cells in his body, and hold him in suspended animation during the ensuing millions of years. Suppose he should really die, destroying his own brain. What lay beyond a real death? Would it be a better plane of existence than the Zoroms could offer him? Would he rediscover humanity, or had they long since arisen to higher planes of existence or reincarnation? Did time exist beyond the mysterious portals of death? If not, then it was possible for him to join the souls of the human race. Had he really been dead all this time? If so, he knew what to expect in case he really destroyed his own brain. Oblivion! Again, the intense feeling of loneliness surged over him and held him within its melancholy grasp. Desperately, he decided to find the nearest cliff and jump from it, head first. Humanity called. No man lived to companion him. His four metal limbs carried him swiftly to the summit of a nearby precipice. Why not gamble on the hereafter? 25X987, understanding his trend of thought, did not attempt to restrain him. Instead, the machine man of Zor waited patiently. As Professor Jameson stood there meditating upon the jump which would hurl him now into a new plane of existence, or into oblivion, the thought transference of 25X987 reached him. It was laden with the wisdom born of many planets and thousands of centuries' experience. "'Why jump?' asked the machine man. "'The dying world holds your imagination within a morbid clutch. It is all a matter of mental condition. Free your mind of this fascinating influence, and come with us to visit other worlds. Many of them are both beautiful and new. You will then feel a great difference. Will you come?' The professor considered for a moment as he resisted the impulse to dive off the declivity to the enticing rocks far below. An inspiration seized him. Backing away from the edge of the cliff, he joined 25X987 once more. "'I shall come,' he stated. He would become an immortal, after all, and join the Zoroms in their never-ending adventures from world to world. They hastened to the spaceship to escape the depressing, dreary influence of the dying world— which had nearly driven Professor Jameson to take the fatal leap to oblivion. End of The Jameson Satellite by Neil R. Jones Recording by Josh Horowitz, Los Angeles Junior by Robert Abernathy All younger generations have been going to the dogs, but this one was genuinely sunk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Junior by Robert Abernethy. Junior, bellowed Pater. Junior, squeaked Mater in a quavering echo. Strayed off again, the young idiot. If he's playing in the shallows, with this tide going out, Pater let the sentence hang blackly. He leaned upslope as far as he could stretch, angrily scanning the shoreward reaches where the light filtered more brightly down through the murky water, where the sea surface glinted like bits of broken mirror. No sign of Junior. Mater was peering fearfully in the other direction, toward where, as the daylight faded, the slope of the coastal shelf was fast losing itself in green profundity. Out there, out of sight at this hour, the reef that loomed sheltering above them fell away in an abrupt cliff-head, and the abyss began. "'Oh, oh!' sobbed Mater. "'He's lost! He swum into the abyss and been eaten by a sea-monster!' Her slender stem rippled and swayed on its base, and her delicate crown of pinkish tentacles 
trailed dishevelledly in the pull of the ebb tide. Pish, my dear, said Pater. There are no sea monsters. At worst, he consoled her stoutly, Junior may have been trapped in a tide pool. Oh, oh, gulped Mater. He's been eaten by a land monster. There are no land monsters, snorted Pater. He straightened his stalk so abruptly that the stone to which he and Mater were conjugally attached creaked under them. How often must I assure you, my dear, that we are the highest form of life? And as for his world and geologic epoch, he was quite right. Oh, oh, gulped Mater. Her spouse gave her up. Junior, he roared in a voice that loosened the coral above the reef. Round about the couple's bereavement had begun to attract attention. In the thickening dust, tentacles paused from winnowing the sea for their master's suppers. Stalked heads turned curiously here and there in the colony. Not far away, a threesome of maiden ants, rooted en brosse to a single substantial boulder, twittered condolences and watched Mater avidly. Discipline, growled Pater. That's what he needs. Just wait till I... Now, dear, began Mater shakily. Hi, folks, piped Junior from overhead. His parents swiveled as if on a single stalk. Their offspring was floating a few fathoms above them, paddling lazily against the ebb. Plainly he had just swum from some crevice in the reef nearby. In one pair of dangling tentacles he absently hugged a roundish stone, worn sensuously smooth by the pounding surf. Where have you been? Nowhere, said Junior innocently, just playing hide-and-go-sink with the squids. With the other polyps, Mater corrected him primly. She detested slang. Pater was eyeing Junior with an ominous calm. And where, he asked, did you get that stone? Junior contracted guiltily. The surf stone slipped from his tentacles and plummeted to the sea floor in a flurry of sand. He edged away, stammering. Well, I guess, maybe, I might have gone a little ways toward the beach. You guess? When I was a polyp, said Pater, the small fry obeyed their elders, and no guess about it. Now, dear, said Mater, no spawn of mine, Pater warmed to his lecture, is going to flout my words. Junior, come here. Junior paddled cautiously around the home site just out of tentacle reach. He said in a small voice, I won't. Did you hear me? Yes, admitted Junior. The neighbors stared. The three maiden ants clutched one another with muted shrieks, savoring beforehand the language Pater would now use. But Pater said, Oh, no more. Now, dear, put in Mater quickly, we must be patient. You know all children go through larval stages. When I was a polyp, Peter began rustily, he coughed out an accidentally inhaled crustacean and started over. No spawn of mine, trailing off he only glared, then roared abruptly, Sprat! I won't, said Junior reflexively, and back paddled into the coral shadows of the reef. That wallop, seethed Peter, wants a good polyping. I mean, he glowered suspiciously at Mater and the neighbors. Dear, soothed Mater, didn't you notice? Of course I noticed what? What Junior was doing, carrying a stone. I don't suppose he understands why, just yet, but... A stone? Ah, ah, uh, to be sure, a stone. Why, my dear, do you realize what this means? Pater was once more occupied with improving Mater's mind. It was a long job, without foreseeable end, especially since he and his helpmate were both firmly rooted for life to the same tastefully decorated home site, garnished by Pater himself with colored pebbles, shells, urchins, and bits of coral, in a rather rococo style that had prevailed during Pater's courting days as a free-swimming polyp. Intelligence, my dear, pronounced Pater, is quite incompatible with motility. Just think. How could ideals congeal in a brain scuttling hither and yon, bombarded by ever-changing sense impressions? Look at the lower species, which swim about all their life, incapable of taking root or thought. True intelligence, my dear, as distinguished from instinct, of course, presupposes the fixed viewpoint, 
He paused. Mater muttered, Yes, dear, as she always did obediently at this point. Junior undulated past, swimming toward the abyss. He moved a bit heavily now. It was growing harder for him to keep his maturely thickening afterbody in a horizontal position. Just look at the young of our own kind, said Pater. Scatter-brained larvae, wandering greedily about in search of new stimuli. But, praise be, they mature at last into sensible, sensible adults. While yet the unformed intellect rebels against the end of carefree polyphood. Instinct, the wisdom of nature, instructs them to prepare for the great change. He nodded wisely as Junior came gliding back out of the gloom of deep water. Junior's tentacles clutched an irregular basalt fragment, which he must have picked up down the rubble-strewn slope. As he paddled slowly along the rim of the reef, the adult antheozoans located directly below looked up and hissed irritable warnings. He was swimming a bit more easily now, and, if Pater had not been a firm believer in instinct, he might have been reminded of the grossly materialistic theory propounded by some iconoclasts according to which a mature polyp's tendency to grapple objects was merely a matter of taking on ballast. See, declared Pater triumphantly, I don't suppose he understands why just yet, but instinct urges him infallibly to assemble the materials for his future home site. Junior let the rock fragment fall and began plucking restlessly at the coral outcropping. Dear, said Mater, don't you think you ought to tell him? Ahem, <clears throat> said Pater. THE WISDOM OF INSTINCT As you've always said, a polyp needs a parent's guidance, remarked Mater. Ahem, <clears throat> repeated Pater. He straightened his stalk and bellowed authoritatively, Junior, come here. The prodigal polyp swung warily close. Yes, Pater? Junior, said his parent solemnly, now that you're about to grow down, it behooves you to know certain facts. Mater blushed a delicate lavender and turned away on her side of the rock. Very soon now, said Pater, you will begin to feel an irresistible urge, to sink to the bottom, to take root there in some sheltered location that will be your lifetime site. Perhaps you even have an understanding already with some, um, charming young polyp of the opposite gender whom you would invite to share your home site. Or, if not, you should take all the more pains to make the site as attractive as possible, in order that such a one may decide to grace it with— Aha, uh -huh, said Junior understandingly. That's what the fellows mean when they say any of them will fall for a few high-class rocks. Pater marshaled his thoughts again. Well, quite apart from such material considerations as selecting the right rocks, there are certain, uh, matters we do not ordinarily discuss. Mater blushed a more pronounced lavender. The three maiden ants, rooted to their boulder within easy earshot of Pater's carrying voice, put up a respectable pretense of searching one another for non-existent water fleas. No doubt, said Pater, in the course of your harem-scarum adventurings as a normal polyp among polyps, you've noticed the ways in which the lower orders reproduce themselves, the activities of fishes, the crustacea, the marine worms will not have escaped your attention. Aha, uh -huh, said Junior, treading water. You will have observed that among these there takes place a good deal of, um, maneuvering for position. But among intelligent, firmly rooted beings like ourselves, matters are, of course, on a less crude and direct plane. What among lesser creatures is a question of tactics belongs, for us, to the realm of strategy. Pater's tone grew confiding. Now, Junior, once you've settled, you'll realize the importance of being easy in your mind about your offspring's parentage. Remember, a niche in brine saves trying. Nothing like choosing your location well in the first place. Study the currents around your prospective site, particularly their direction and force at such critical times as flood tide. Try to make sure that you and your future mate won't be too close down current from anybody else's sight, since in a case like that accidents can happen. You understand, Junior? Uh-huh, acknowledged Junior. That's what the fellows mean when they say don't let anybody get the drop on you. Well, said Pater in flat disapproval, 
but it all seems sort of silly said junior stubbornly i'd rather just keep moving around and not have to do all that figuring and the ocean's full of things i haven't seen yet i don't want to grow down mater paled with shock pater gave his spawn a scalding scandalized look you'll learn you can't beat biology he said thickly creditably keeping his voice down junior you may go junior bobbled off and pater admonished mater sternly we must have patience my dear all children pass through these larval stages yes dear sighed mater at long last junior seemed to have resigned himself to making the best of it with considerable exertions hampered by his increasing body heaviness he was fetching loads of stones seaweed and other debris to a spot downslope and there labored over what promised to be a fairly ambitious carn judging by what they could see of it his home site might even prove a credit to the colony so went pater's thoughts and attract a mate who would be a good catch thus mater mused junior was still to be seen at times along the reef in the company of his free-swimming friends among the other polyps at some of whom his parents had always looked askance fearing they were by no means well-bred in fact there was a strong suspicion that some of them waifs from the disrespectable shallows district in the hazardous reaches just below the tide mark had never been bred at all but were products of budding a practice frowned on in polite society however junior's appearance and rate of locomotion made it clear he would soon be done with juvenile follies as pater repeated with satisfaction you can't beat biology as one becomes more and more bottle-shaped the romantic illusions of youth must inevitably perish i've always known there was sound stuff in the youngster declared pater expansively at least he won't be able to go around with those ragamuffins much longer breathed mater thankfully what does that young fool think he's doing fiddling around with soapstone grumbled pater peering critically through the green to try to make out the details of junior's building doesn't he know it's apt to slip its place in a year or two look dear hissed mater acidly isn't that the young polyp who was so rude once i wish she wouldn't keep watching junior like that our northwest neighbors hear positively that she's a child of an only parent never mind pater turned to reassure her once junior is properly rooted his self-respect will cause him to keep the riffraff at a distance it's a matter of psychology my dear the vertical position makes all the difference in one's thinking the great day arrived laboriously junior put a few finishing touches on his construction which so far as could be seen from a distance had turned out decent-looking enough though it was rather questionably original in design lower and flatter than was customary with one more look at his handiwork junior turned bottom end down and sank wearily into the finished sight after a minute he paddled experimentally but flailing tentacles failed to lift him he was already rooted and growing more solidly so by the moment congratulations cried the neighbors pater and mater bowed this way and that in acknowledgment mater waved a condescending tentacle at the three maiden ants i told you so said pater triumphantly yes dear said mater meekly suddenly there was an outcry of alarm from the dwellers down reef a wave of dismay swept audibly through all the nearer parts of the colony pater and mater looked around frozen junior had begun to paddle again but this time in a most peculiar manner with a rotary twist and sideways scoop which looked awkward but which he performed so deftly that he must have practiced it fixed upright he was now on the platform he had built and looked for all the world as if he were trying to swim sideways he's gone mad squeaked mater i gulped pater i'm afraid not at least they saw there was a method to junior's actions he went on paddling in the same fashion and now he and his platform with him were further away than they had been and growing more remote as they stared parts of the home site that was not a home site revolved in some way incomprehensible to eyes that had never seen the like and the whole affair trundled along rocking at bumps in the sandy bottom and squeaking painfully nevertheless it moved the polyps watching from the reef swam out and frolicked after junior watching his contrivance go and clattering eager questions while their parents bawled at them to keep away from that 
The three maiden ants shrieked faintly and swooned in one another's tentacles. The colony was shaken as it had not been since the tidal wave. Come back, thundered Pater. You can't do that. Come back, shrilled Mater. You can't do that. Come back, gabbled the neighbors. You can't do that. But Junior was past listening to reason. Junior was on wheels. End of Junior by Robert Abernathy Melanta Tata by Edgar Allan Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard Melanta Tata by Edgar Allan Poe to the editors of the ladies book i have the honor of sending you for your magazine an article which i hope you will be able to comprehend rather more distinctly than i do myself it is a translation by my friend martin van buren mavis sometimes called the poughkeepsie seer of an odd-looking manuscript which i found about a year ago tightly corked up in a jug floating in the mare tenebrarum a sea well described by the Nubian geographer, but seldom visited nowadays, except for the transcendentalists and diverse for crotchets. Truly yours, Edgar A. Poe. On Board Balloon, Skylark, April 1st, 2848. Now, my dear friend, now for your sins, you are to suffer the infliction of a long gossiping letter i tell you distinctly that i am going to punish you for all your impertinence by being as tedious as discursive as incoherent and unsatisfactory as possible besides here i am cooped up in a dirty balloon with some one or two hundred of the canal all bound on a pleasure excursion what a funny idea some people have of pleasure and i have no prospect of touching terra firma for a month at least nobody to talk to nothing to do when one has nothing to do then is the time to correspond with one's friends you perceive then why it is that i write you this letter it is on account of my ennui and your sins get ready your spectacles and make up your mind to be annoyed i mean to write at you every day during this odious voyage Hi ho when will any invention visit the human pericranium are we forever to be doomed to the thousand inconveniences of the balloon? Will nobody contrive a more expeditious mode of progress? The jog-trot movement, to my thinking, is little less than positive torture. Upon my word, we have not made more than a hundred miles the hour since leaving home. The very birds beat us, at least some of them. I assure you that I do not exaggerate at all. Our motion, no doubt, seems slower than it actually is this on account of our having no objects about us by which to estimate our velocity and on account of our going with the wind to be sure whenever we meet a balloon we have a chance of perceiving our rate and then i admit things do not appear so very bad accustomed as i am to this mode of travelling i cannot get over a kind of giddiness whenever a balloon passes us in a current directly overhead it always seems to me like an immense bird of prey about to pounce upon us and carry us off in its claws one went over us this morning about sunrise and so nearly overhead that its drag rope actually brushed the network suspending our car and caused us very serious apprehension our captain said that if the material of the bag had been the trumpery varnished silk of five hundred or a thousand years ago we should inevitably have been damaged this silk as he explained it to me was a fabric composed of the entrails of a species of earthworm the worm was carefully fed on mulberries kind of fruit resembling a watermelon and when sufficiently fat was crushed in a mill the paste thus arising was called papyrus in its primary state and went through a variety of processes until it finally became silk singular to relate it was once much admired as an article of female dress 
balloons were also very generally constructed from it a better kind of material it appears was subsequently found in the down surrounding the sea vessels of a plant vulgarly called euphorbium and at that time botanically termed milkweed this latter kind of silk was designated as silk buckingham on account of its superior durability and was usually prepared for use by being varnished with a solution of gum caoutchouc a substance which in some respects must have resembled the gutta percha now in common use the caoutchouc was occasionally called indian rubber or rubber of twists and was no doubt one of the numerous fungi never tell me again that i am not at heart an antiquarian talking of drag ropes our own it seems as this moment knocked a man overboard from one of the small magnetic propellers that swarm in ocean below us a boat of about six thousand tons and from all accounts shamefully crowded these diminutive barks should be prohibited from carrying more than a definite number of passengers the man of course was not permitted to get on board again and was soon out of sight he and his life preserver i rejoice my dear friend that we live in an age so enlightened that no such a thing as an individual is supposed to exist it is the mass for which the true humanity cares by the by talking of humanity do you know that our immortal wiggins is not so original in his views of the social condition and so forth as his contemporaries are inclined to suppose pundit assures me that the same ideas were put nearly in the same way about a thousand years ago by an irish philosopher called furrier on account of his keeping a retail shop for cat peltries and other furs pundit knows you know there can be no mistake about it how very wonderfully do we see verified every day the profound observation of the hindu aries total as quoted by pundit thus must we say that not once or twice or a few times but with almost infinite repetitions the same opinions come round in a circle among men april second spoke to-day the magnetic cutter in charge of the middle section of floating telegraph wires i learned that when this species of telegraph was first put into operation by horse it was considered quite impossible to convey the wires over sea but now we are at a loss to comprehend where the difficulty lay so wags the world tempora mutantur excuse me for quoting the etruscan what would we do without the atlantic telegraph pundit says atlantic was the ancient adjective we lay to a few minutes to ask the cutter some questions and learn among other glorious news that civil war is raging in africa while the plague is doing its good work beautifully both in europe and asia is it not truly remarkable that before the magnificent light shed upon philosophy by humanity the world was accustomed to regard war and pestilence as calamities do you know that prayers were actually offered up in the ancient temples to the end that these evils might not be visited upon mankind is it not really difficult to comprehend upon what principle of interest our forefathers acted were they so blind as not to perceive that the destruction of a myriad of individuals is only so much positive advantage to the mass april three it is really a very fine amusement to ascend the rope ladder leading to the summit of the balloon bag and then survey the surrounding world from the car below you know the prospect is not so comprehensive you can see little vertically but seated here where i write this in the luxuriously cushioned open piazza of the summit one can see everything that is going on in all directions just now there is quite a crowd of balloons in sight and they present a very animated appearance while the air is resonant with the hum of so many millions of human voices i have heard it asserted that when yellow or hundred will have it violet who is supposed to have been the first aeronaut maintained the practicability of traversing the atmosphere in all directions 
by merely ascending or descending until a favorable current was attained he was scarcely hearkened to at all by his contemporaries who looked upon him as merely an ingenious sort of madman because the philosophers of the day declared the thing impossible really now it does seem to me quite unaccountable how anything so obviously feasible could have escaped the sagacity of the ancient savants but in all ages the great obstacles to advancement in art have been opposed by the so-called men of science to be sure our men of science are not quite so bigoted as those of old oh i have something so queer to tell you on this topic do you know that it is not more than a thousand years ago since the metaphysicians consented to relieve the people of the singular fancy that there existed but two possible roads for the attainment of truth believe it if you can it appears that long long ago in the night of time there lived a turkish philosopher or hindu possibly called aries tottle this person introduced or at all events propagated what was termed the deductive or a priori mode of investigation he started with what he maintained to be axioms or self-evident truths and thence proceeded logically to results his greatest disciples were one Euclid and one Kant. well aries tottle flourished supreme until advent of one hog surnamed the ettrick shepherd who preached an entirely different system which he called the the a posteriori or inductive his plan referred altogether to sensation he proceeded by observing analyzing and classifying facts instantanea naturae as they were affectedly called into general laws aristotle's mode in a word was based on nomina hogs on phenomena well so great was the admiration excited by this latter system that at its first introduction aries tottle fell into disrepute but finally he recovered ground and was permitted to divide the realm of truth with his more modern rival the savans now maintain the aristotelian and baconian roads were the sole possible avenues to knowledge baconian you must know was an adjective invented as equivalent to hogian and more euphonious and dignified now my dear friend i do assure you most positively that i represent this matter fairly on the soundest authority and you can easily understand how a notion so absurd on its very face must have operated to retard the progress of all true knowledge which makes its advances almost invariably by intuitive bounds the ancient idea confined investigations to crawling and for hundreds of years so great was the infatuation about hog especially that a virtual end was put to all thinking properly so called no man dared utter a truth to which he felt himself indebted to his soul alone it mattered not whether the truth was even demonstrably a truth for the bullet-headed savans of the time regarded only the road by which he had attained it they would not even look at the end let us see the means they cried the means if upon investigation of the means it was found to come under neither the category aries that is to say ram nor under the category hog why then the savants went no farther but pronounced the theorist a fool and would have nothing to do with him or his truth now it cannot be maintained even that by the crawling system the greatest amount of truth would be attained in any long series of ages for the repression of imagination was an evil not to be compensated for by any superior certainty in the ancient modes of investigation the error of these germans these french these english and these americans the latter by the way were our own immediate progenitors was an error quite analogous with that of the wiseacre who fancies that he must necessarily see an object the better the more closely he holds it to his eyes 
these people blinded themselves by details when they proceeded hoggishly their facts were by no means always facts a matter of little consequence had it not been for assuming that they were facts and must be facts because they appeared to be such when they proceeded on the path of the ram their course was scarcely as straight as a ram's horn for they never had an axiom which was an axiom at all they must have been very blind not to see this even in their own day for even in their own day many of the long-established axioms had been rejected for example ex nihilo nihil fit a body cannot act where it is not there cannot exist antipodes darkness cannot come out of light all these and a dozen other similar propositions formerly admitted without hesitation as axioms were even at the period of which i speak seemed to be untenable how absurd in these people then to persist in putting faith in axioms as immutable bases of truth but even out of the mouths of their soundest reasoners it is easy to demonstrate the futility the impalpability of their axioms in general who was the soundest of their logicians let me see i will go and ask a pundit and be back in a minute here we have it here is a book written nearly a thousand years ago and lately translated from the english which by the way appears to have been the rudiment of the american pundit says it is decidedly the cleverest ancient work on its topic logic the author who was much thought of in his day was one miller or mill and we find it recorded of him as a point of some importance that he had a mill horse called bentham but let us glance at the treatise ah ability or inability to conceive says mr mill very properly is in no case to be received as a criterion of axiomatic truth what modern in his senses would ever think of disputing this truism the only wonder with us must be how it happened that mr mill conceived it necessary even to hint at anything so obvious so far good but let us turn over another paper what have we here contradictories cannot both be true that is cannot coexist in nature here mr mill means for example that a tree must be either a tree or not a tree that it cannot be at the same time a tree and not a tree very well but i ask him why his reply is this and never pretends to be anything else than this because it is impossible to conceive that contradictories can both be true but this is no answer at all by his own showing for has he not just admitted as a truism that ability or inability to conceive is in no case to be received as a criterion of axiomatic truth now i do not complain of these ancients so much because their logic is by their own showing utterly baseless worthless and fantastic altogether as because of their pompous and imbecile proscription of all other roads of truth of all other means for its attainment than the two preposterous paths the one of creeping and the one of crawling to which they have dared to confine the soul that loves nothing so well as to soar by the by my dear friend do you not think it would have puzzled these ancient dogmaticians to have determined by which of their two roads it was that the most important and most sublime of all their truths was in effect attained i mean the truth of gravitation newton owed it to kepler kepler admitted that his three laws were guessed at these three laws of all laws which led the great english mathematician to his principle the basis of all physical principle to go behind which we must enter the kingdom of metaphysics kepler guessed that is to say imagined he was essentially a theorist that word now of so much sanctity formerly an epithet of contempt would it not have puzzled these old moles too to have explained by which of the two roads a cryptographist unriddles a cryptograph of more than usual secrecy 
or by which of the two roads champollion directed mankind to those enduring and almost innumerable truths which resulted from his deciphering the hieroglyphics one word more on this topic and i will be done boring you is it not passing strange that with their internal prattling about roads to truth these bigoted people missed what we now so clearly perceive to be the great highway that of consistency does it not seem singular how they should have failed to deduce from the works of god the vital fact that a perfect consistency must be an absolute truth how plain has been our progress since the late announcement of this proposition investigation has been taken out of the hands of the ground moles and given as a task to the true and only true thinkers the men of ardent imagination these latter theorize can you not fancy the shout of scorn with which my words would be received by our progenitors were it possible for them to be now looking over my shoulder these men i say theorize and their theories are simply corrected reduced systematized cleared little by little of their dross of inconsistency until finally a perfect consistency stands apparent which even the most stolid admit because it is a consistency to be an absolute and an unquestionable truth april four the new gas is doing wonders in conjunction with the new improvement with gutta percha a very safe commodious manageable and in every respect convenient are our modern balloons here is an immense one approaching us at the rate of at least a hundred and fifty miles an hour it seems to be crowded with people perhaps there are three or four hundred passengers and yet it soars to an elevation of nearly a mile looking down upon poor us with sovereign contempt still a hundred or even two hundred miles an hour is slow travelling after all do you remember our flight on the railroad across the canada continent fully three hundred miles the hour that was travelling nothing to be seen though nothing to be done but flirt feast and dance in the magnificent saloons do you remember what an odd sensation was experienced when by chance we caught a glimpse of external objects while the cars were in full flight everything seemed unique in one mass for my part i cannot say but that it preferred the travelling by the slow train of a hundred miles the hour here we were permitted to have glass windows even to have them open and something like a distinct view of the country was attainable pundit says that the route for the great canada railroad must have been in some measure marked out about nine hundred years ago in fact he goes so far as to assert that actual traces of a road are still discernible traces referable to a period quite as remote as that mentioned the track it appears was double only ours you know has twelve paths and three or four new ones are in preparation the ancient rails were very slight and placed so close together as to be according to modern notions quite frivolous if not dangerous in the extreme the present width of track fifty feet is considered indeed scarcely secure enough for my part i make no doubt that a track of some sort must have existed in very remote times as pundit asserts for nothing can be clearer to my mind than that at some period not less than seven centuries ago certainly the northern and southern canada continents were united the canadians then would have been driven by necessity to a great railroad across the continent april fifth i am almost devoured by ennui pundit is the only conversable person on board and he poor soul can speak of nothing but antiquities he has been occupied all the day in the attempt to convince me that the ancient americans governed themselves did ever anybody hear of such an absurdity that they existed in a sort of every man for himself confederacy after the fashion of the prairie dogs that we read of in fable he says that they started with the queerest idea conceivable viz 
that all men are born free and equal that this in the very teeth of the laws of gradation so visibly impressed upon all things both in the moral and physical universe every man voted as they called it that is to say meddled with public affairs until at length it was discovered that what is everybody's business is nobody's and that the republic so the absurd thing was called was without a government at all it is related however that the first circumstance which disturbed very particularly the self-complacency of the philosophers who constructed this republic was the startling discovery that universal suffrage gave opportunity for fraudulent schemes by means of which any desired number of votes might at any time be polled without the possibility of prevention or even detection by any party which should be merely villainous enough not to be ashamed of the fraud a little reflection upon this discovery sufficed to render evident the consequences which were that rascality must predominate in a word that a republican government could never be anything but a rascally one while the philosophers however were busied in blushing at their stupidity in not having foreseen these inevitable evils and intent upon the invention of new theories the matter was put to an abrupt issue by a fellow of the name of mob who took everything into his own hands and set up a despotism in comparison with which those of the fabulous zeros and hello fagabaluses were respectable and delectable this mob a foreigner by the by is said to have been the most odious of all men that ever encumbered the earth he was a giant in stature insolent rapacious filthy had the gall of a bullock with the heart of a hyena and the brains of a peacock he died at length by dint of his own energies which exhausted him nevertheless he had his uses as everything has however vile and taught mankind a lesson which to this day it is in no danger of forgetting never to run directly contrary to the natural analogies as for republicanism no analogy could be found for it upon the face of the earth unless we accept the case of the prairie dogs an exception which seems to demonstrate if anything that democracy is a very admirable form of government for dogs april six last night had a fine view of alpha lyrae whose disc through our captain's spyglass subtends an angle of half a degree looking very much as our sun does to the naked eye on a misty day alpha lyrae although so very much larger than our sun by the by resembles him closely as regards its spots its atmosphere and in many other particulars it is only within the last century pundit tells me that the binary relation existing between these two orbs began even to be suspected the evident motion of our system in the heavens was strange to say referred to an orbit about a prodigious star in the centre of the galaxy about this star or at all events about a centre of gravity common to all the globes of the milky way and supposed to be near alcyon in the pleiades every one of these globes was declared to be revolving our own performing the circuit in a period of a hundred and seventeen million of years we with our present lights our vast telescopic improvements and so forth of course find it difficult to comprehend the ground of an idea such as this its first propagator was one modler he was led we must presume to this wild hypothesis by mere analogy in the first instance but this being the case he should have at least adhered to analogy in its development a great central orb was in fact suggested so far mother was consistent the central orb however dynamically should have been greater than all the surrounding orbs taken together the question might then have been asked why do we not see it we especially who occupy the mid-region of the cluster the very locality near which at least must be situated this inconceivable central sun 
the astronomer perhaps at this point took refuge in the suggestion of non-luminosity and here analogy was suddenly let fall but even admitting the central orb non-luminous how did he manage to explain its failure to be rendered visible by the incalculable host of glorious suns glaring in all directions about it no doubt what he finally maintained was merely a centre of gravity common to all the revolving orbs but here again analogy must have been let fall our system revolves it is true about a common centre of gravity but it does this in connection with and in consequence of a material sun whose mass more than counterbalances the rest of the system the mathematical circle is a curve composed of an infinity of straight lines but this idea of the circle this idea of it which in regard to all earthly geometry we consider as merely the mathematical in contradistinction from the practical idea is in sober fact the practical conception which alone we have any right to entertain in respect to those titanic circles with which we have to deal at least in fancy when we suppose our system with its fellows revolving about a point in the centre of the galaxy let the most vigorous of human imaginations but attempt to take a single step toward the comprehension of a circuit so unutterable i would scarcely be paradoxical to say that a flash of lightning itself travelling for ever upon the circumference of this inconceivable circle would still for ever be travelling in a straight line that the path of our sun along such a circumference that the direction of our system in such an orbit would to any human perception deviate in the slightest degree from a straight line even in a million of years is a proposition not to be entertained and yet these ancient astronomers were absolutely cajoled it appeared into believing that a decisive curvature had become apparent during the brief period of their astronomical history during the mere point during the utter nothingness of two or three thousand years how incomprehensible that considerations such as this did not at once indicate to them the true state of affairs that of the binary revolution of our sun and alpha lyrae around a common centre of gravity april seventh continued last night our astronomical amusements had a fine view of the fine neptunian asteroids and watched with much interest the putting up of a huge impost on a couple of lentils in the new temple of daphnis in the moon it was amusing to think that creatures so diminutive as the lunarians and bearing so little resemblance to humanity yet evinced a mechanical ingenuity so much superior to our own one finds it difficult too to conceive the vast masses which these people handle so easily to be as light as our own reason tells us they actually are april eight eureka pundit is in his glory a balloon from canada spoke us to-day and threw on board several late papers they contain some exceedingly curious information relative to canadian or rather american antiquities you know i presume that labourers have for some months been employed in preparing the ground for a new fountain at paradise the emperor's principal pleasure garden paradise it appears has been literally speaking an island time out of mind that is to say its northern boundary was always as far back as any record extends a rivulet or rather a very narrow arm of the sea this arm was gradually widened until it attained its present breadth a mile the whole length of the island is nine miles the breadth varies materially the entire area so pundit says was about eight hundred years ago densely packed with houses some of them twenty stories high land for some most unaccountable reason being considered as especially precious just in this vicinity the disastrous earthquake however of the year twenty fifty so totally uprooted and overwhelmed the town for it was almost too large to be called a village 
that the most indefatigable of our antiquarians have never yet been able to obtain from the site any sufficient data in the shape of coins medals or inscriptions wherewith to build up even the ghost of a theory concerning the manners customs etc 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 of the aboriginal inhabitants nearly all that we have hitherto known of them that they were a portion of the knickerbocker tribe of savages infesting the continent at its first discovery by recorder Riker, a knight of the golden fleece they were by no means uncivilized however but cultivated various arts and even sciences after a fashion of their own it is related of them that they were acute in many respects but were oddly afflicted with monomania for building what in the ancient american was denominated churches a kind of pagoda instituted for the worship of two idols that went by the names of wealth and fashion in the end it is said the island became nine-tenths of it church the women too it appears were oddly deformed by a natural protuberance of the region just below the small of the back although most unaccountably this deformity was looked upon altogether in the light of a beauty one or two pictures of these singular women have in fact been miraculously preserved they look very odd very like something between a turkey-cock and a dromedary well these few details are nearly all that have descended to us respecting the ancient knickerbockers it seems however that while digging in the centre of the emperor's garden which you know covers the whole island some of the workmen unearthed a cubicle in evidently chiselled block of granite weighing several hundred pounds it was in good preservation having received apparently little injury from the convulsion which entombed it on one of its surfaces was a marble slab with only think of it an inscription a legible inscription pundit is in ecstasies upon detaching the slab a cavity appeared containing a leaden box filled with various coins a long scroll of names several documents which appear to resemble newspapers with other matters of intense interest to the antiquarian there can be no doubt that all these are genuine american relics belonging to the tribe called knickerbocker the papers thrown on board our balloon are filled with facsimiles of the coins manuscripts typography etc etc i copy for your amusement the knickerbocker inscription on the marble slab this cornerstone of a monument to the memory of george washington was laid with appropriate ceremonies on the nineteenth day of october eighteen forty seven the anniversary of the surrender of lord cornwallis to general washington at yorktown a d seventeen eighty one under the auspices of the washington monument association of the city of new york this as i give it is a verbatim translation done by pundit himself so there can be no mistake about it from the few words thus preserved we glean several important items of knowledge not the least interesting of which is the fact that a thousand years ago actual monuments had fallen into disuse as was all very proper the people contenting themselves as we do now with a mere indication of the design to erect a monument at some future time a cornerstone being cautiously laid by itself solitary and alone excuse me for quoting the great american poet Benton. as a guarantee of the magnanimous intention we ascertain too very distinctly from this admirable inscription the how as well as the where and the what of the great surrender in question as to the where it was yorktown wherever that was and as to the what it was general cornwallis no doubt some wealthy dealer in corn he was surrendered the inscription commemorates the surrender of what why of lord cornwallis the only question is what could the savages wish him surrendered for but when we remember that these savages were undoubtedly cannibals 
we are led to the conclusion that they intended him for sausage as to the how of his surrender no language can be more explicit lord cornwallis was surrendered for sausage under the auspices of the washington monument association no doubt a charitable institution for the depositing of corner stones but heaven bless me what is the matter ah i see the balloon has collapsed and we shall have a tumble into the sea i have therefore only time enough to add that from a hasty inspection of the facsimiles of newspapers etc etc i find that the great men in those days among the americans were one john a smith and one zachary a tailor good-bye until i see you again whether you ever get this letter or not is point of little importance as i write altogether for my own amusement i shall cork the manuscript up in a bottle however and throw it into the sea yours everlastingly pandita End of Melanctotata by Edgar Allan Poe